Amen. That is the perfect way to launch the conversation that we're going to have for the remainder of the time that we have this morning. I, uh, I lost a mentor a couple of weeks ago. He passed away. Now, to be fair, Lynn Laughlin was a mentor to a whole bunch of people, hundreds if not thousands of people looked up to him. He served a long storied career at my alma mater, Lincoln Christian College. He was a basketball coach. A whole lot of people, when they saw him, they would say, hey, coach. He served in a whole bunch of roles, teaching as a professor and then as an administrator, as an ambassador for the school. He passed away several or a couple weeks ago, and last Saturday was a memorial service. I couldn't be there in person, so I watched it online. They streamed it. And I was reminded of, my goodness, what an incredible impact he had just being him, living his life. One person, as they memorialized him, told a story, and I could picture the story in my mind's eye as they were talking. If you watched him from a distance, and sometimes I would, he would make his way across campus, not in a straight line, but kind of it looked like a zigzag pattern. It looked like this. He'd walk this way, and, you know, then he'd walk this way, and... He would zigzag his way across campus, sometimes getting off of the sidewalk. Why? So he could pick up my trash. As you can imagine, a bunch of college kids can sometimes be messy. He would pick up trash, selflessly serving God by picking up trash. This is one of the vice presidents of the college, one of the ambassadors for the school. I'm reminded of this passage. It's in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your, oh, that's a big word, That's a hard one to swallow. A servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, as if that's not a bad enough. A slave, just as the Son of Man, he's talking about himself autobiographically here, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Oh. Lynn was a mentor of mine even before I decided to go to college there in my hometown. You understand, I grew up just a few miles from my alma mater. I grew up in a church in my hometown of Lincoln, Illinois. And we would do this thing every once in a while. It was called a potluck dinner. I mourn the passing of potluck dinners in the rhythm of church life. As a middle school kid, I could kill a potluck dinner. You know who was always there, or more times than not was there? Lynn Laughlin. We would gather for these potluck dinners, sometimes at the church building in my home church, but oftentimes we would go to the campus because there was a larger building there that we could borrow for an event like that. It was called Taylor Hall. Hold on to that thought. Skip ahead a few years, I would go off to college, and uh, I auditioned for a group that traveled as an ambassador for the school. It was called Dayspring. You might not know this about your preacher, but I can sometimes carry a tune. Part of my job on that team was to sing. Part of my job was to preach. I was the speaker for their group. And for two years, I traveled those summers for the school. As as an ambassador for the school, it covered some of my tuition. I got a scholarship as a piece of this. More than that, I got the opportunity to learn how to do this thing, leading in the local church. It's a great opportunity for me. We were on campus oftentimes alone. There were girls in their dorms. I don't know what they did at night, but the dudes, we would go out just like, you know, a 20-year-old will often do and cause a little bit of trouble. Usually it was meaningless or, you know, harmless kind of trouble, silliness. But you put a bunch of guys together in a space and somebody dares somebody else and the next thing you know you're doing something dumb like, oh, I learned I could take a credit card or a uh, driver's license and if you did just the right way through this doorway, you could pop into the maintenance shed. That's breaking and entering. I think that's a sin. There was a, um, there was a golf cart in there. A bunch of dumb college kids. 
We looked at that golf cart the first time we were in there. We walked past it the second time. We know exactly whose it is. His name was Alan Taylor. Remember Taylor Hall? The story was they sold the family farm, gave that money. Oh, my goodness, this is an investment, not by addition, but by multiplication. They invested into continuing education for preachers and teachers that are going to go out and do kingdom advancement work. You talk about a sacrificial gift to advance God's kingdom. This is the type of man we're talking about. I think the school was paying him like a dollar a year or something like that. He was the guy that if your light bulb burned out in your dorm room, you made a phone call, yeah, a phone call back in that day, and uh, Alan Taylor would show up on his golf cart to serve you, this retired farmer serving college kids. And we looked at that golf cart and we thought, that would be so much fun to take that sucker joy riding out all over campus in the middle of the night. Dumb, dumb, dumb. The first time, we just took it a little ways. You know exactly how this story goes. The last time, the last time we took it out, we broke his golf cart. Not just broke it, but like he had fluorescent tubes in the back of this, like um, light bulbs. The whole thing shattered. I mean, it's just a mess. We spent the rest of the night trying to put things back together, close the door behind us. That next morning, now in the bright light of day, I'm walking to breakfast, and I hear my name. It's Lynn. Yeah, he was my boss's boss's boss, several layers above me at that point. Hey, Stan, do you know anything about the broken golf cart and all oh, the shame? <laughs> He could have done several things in that moment. He could have shamed me. He could have fired me. I could have lost a scholarship. It could have been all kinds of disaster. The servant leader in Lynn leaked out in that moment. I want to show you this passage, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, breaking and entering, stealing, that's one of the Ten Commandments, y'all. You who live by the Spirit, this is Lynn, should restore that person gently. Sometimes serving looks like picking up trash. Sometimes it looks like pulling quietly, pulling aside a 20-year-old and gently restoring them to ministry. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. The Pharisees were tempted. Oftentimes what they would do is they would call that person out publicly in their sin. Have you ever read the story about the woman caught in the act of adultery? Shame. Let's throw rocks at her until she's dead. We need to treat people or teach people a lesson about this, right? Jesus had strong words to say in that story to the Pharisees, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Today's message is titled, Serve Somebody. Sometimes it looks like anonymous, selfless, picking up the trash that nobody else wants to pick up. Sometimes it's like, hey, come over here. Can we have an honest conversation? Can I risk enough to speak the truth to you in love and serve you in this manner? Before we talk about what serving looks like, let's talk about what it is not. <laughs> We're talking about the Pharisees through this whole series. If you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. Serving's opposite is external righteousness. This is what the Pharisees are guilty of, external righteousness. Let's slow down just for a minute. There is a lot in that sentence. Serving's opposite is external righteousness. What do we mean by that? Jesus talks about this. Jesus defines this in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. I think he is picturing the Pharisees in his mind's eye. He opens up his mouth. He says this, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your heavenly your, your Father in heaven. Well, the reward's already be, been given. He explains this. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, well, they've already received their reward in full. Don't do that. Don't be like the Pharisees. 
But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, he sees you zigzagging across that campus, picking up trash. Well, then he'll, he's going to be the one that rewards you. And I can't help but think, Lynn is receiving an incredible reward with Jesus, in Jesus, heaven, Lynn's eternal home right now. What did I say? Serving's opposite is external righteousness. You might be tempted to think that the opposite of serving is laying on the couch. Well, maybe sometimes it is. Perhaps you remember the story of Mary and Martha. Martha is so busy doing the serving doing the things. Mary is with Jesus, and Jesus says, oh, this is so important. This is another form of serving, being with Jesus, or maybe serving Jesus' people, pulling aside a 20-year-old and gently loving them and restoring them back to spiritual health. Now, the opposite of serving is being served. Think about a server in a restaurant, a waiter, and, oh, let's call them the eater. Now, the eater, the dining, the person dining, they could, in fact, serve the waiter or the waitress. And by the way, I would encourage you as Jesus people, we are called to do that, to serve them well with kindness and words of affirmation and all kinds of things, including a good tip. The opposite of serving is being served, though, just sitting there saying, hey, you just bring my stuff to me. Thank you very much. When I put, when I put my acts of righteousness on display just to be seen, I am feeding, hear me clearly, I am feeding on your attention. Look at me. When I notice you looking at me, that puffs me up. Love builds up builds up, but oh, this stuff puffs up. I'm feeding on your attention. I'm feeding on your approval. I'm feeding on your adoration. Feeding on external righteousness. Yeah, I said what I said. The opposite of a servant is a Pharisee. Hi, my name is Stan, and I am a recovering Pharisee most days. Some days I take two steps backwards. I hope then I can take three steps forward along this journey that Jesus is calling me on. Everybody wants to save the world. Have you ever heard of Jordan Peterson? He's all the rage right now out in culture. He's a smart, smart dude. He talks about this in one of his books. He says, you want to save the world? Start by making your bed. Start with an act of discipline that nobody sees. You remember the woes in the New Testament? We talked about this week one of this series. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he said seven times, woe to you. Matthew chapter 3, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. If you want to save the world, maybe start by picking up the trash. If you want to save the world, maybe start by quietly restoring a 20-year-old gently. Have an honest conversation with no, that, that nobody knows that you're having that conversation until he tells the story almost 30 years later after you've passed away. We're studying this group of people who are very religious, very devoted, and yet they missed the heart of what it means to serve God, the Pharisees. Here's another woe right before the one we just read. Verse 23, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Do you remember the masks? We're putting on an image, but underneath, we don't know what. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. I've read this verse several times during this series, and every time I read it, I picture in my mind's eye a photograph. I went back this week, and I looked for it, and I found it. Check this out. In the old city of Jerusalem, the Muslim quarter, I've walked through this shop a few times now, snapped some pictures. I believe it's owned by a family that came from Egypt. 
there's a little bit of a mixed metaphor going on here. This is a, a pyramid, I think, from Egypt, made out of spices. And at the top of it is the Dome of the Rock, which sits on top of the uh, Solomon's, or, or, or rather, uh, the, the, the first century temple in Jerusalem. Um, mixed metaphor there. But every time I walk past that, I think, oh my goodness, that takes a volume of work every morning fixing that, neatening that up, building a pyramid out of spices. There's a lot of work invested in that, just like there was a lot of work in the Pharisees tithing from their spice cabinet. Nine for me, one for God. Nine for me, one for God. You've put a lot of work in on this. You give a tenth of your spices, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law. Let's look at that here. Justice more important matters, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Jesus is going old school here with his admonition. He's leaning on something that, hear me, he spoke hundreds of years before this through the minor prophet Micah. Micah's name literally means who is like God or one who resembles God. God is speaking through the prophet Micah. Listen to this, this admonition to a group of legalistic people in Micah's day, hundreds of years before Jesus talked in Matthew chapter 23. He says this, what, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? You get the question he's asking, how do I worship God? How do I do this well? And then he poses a whole bunch of examples. Would it look like this? Would it look like this? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, the best calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. Well, he, he's shown you. He's shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does he want from you as you worship him with your life? Well, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Does that sound familiar? Jesus said justice. He said mercy. And he said faithfulness, which is another way of saying walking humbly with your God. Be faithful as you walk around life. I want to unpack that with the rest of the time we have together today. And then I want to send you out of here with, with some very practical ways you can do just that. The Pharisees have come to political power through religious power in the years between Micah's admonition and Jesus reinforcing the words that he spoke through Micah hundreds of years before that. We have to ask the question, though, why is serving so important? I want to suggest two ways, two reasons why it is so important. First of all, it's important to them. Who's them? Well, it might be a 20-year-old who's watching you to see if you practice what you preach. It might be your neighbor. It might be your one. You have one life to invest. Who is the one life you're investing in? It might be culture at large, the folks that are watching you because they know you're a Jesus follower. Well, do you practice what you preach? Does your life match what you say? Are you smoking what you're selling? Serving is important to them. I saw a quote this past week. It made my heart slow down just for a bit. Oh, is your church primarily seeking and saving the lost? That is the mission statement, right? To seek and to save the lost? Or is it servicing and satisfying the saved? That cut to the heart of this, Pastor. I want to make sure we're keeping the main thing the main thing. I want to make sure we're focusing where Jesus called us to focus. It's so easy through a consumer lens to fall back into the ladder. Let me be super clear. Serving is important to them. And we don't do our acts of service to be noticed. Before we go any further, can we just be real clear about that? We do not do our acts of service to be noticed, but when we don't serve, that gets noticed. 
that's the negative way to say it. If I could say it more positively, when we do serve, that does get noticed. We just have to simply acknowledge that. By the way, serving is important. Why? We're the church. And we're in this thing together. I was thinking about that principle, and this past week I read a story from years ago. JFK said, hey, we're going to go to the moon. And it's going to take all to make that happen. Years later, after standing up in front of the nation and making that speech, he's touring a NASA, the, the NASA headquarters, and he sees a man who is mopping the floor. And he says to this man, I think his title was janitor. He said, well, what do you do? This is years after that speech. The janitor turned to him and said, well, I'm putting the first man on the moon, sir. I love that. We are in this thing together. The janitor could have said, I clean the floors and I empty trash. trash." Instead, he saw his role in a bigger mission, and that was to fulfill the vision of the president. As far as he was concerned, he was making history. Listen, when you serve the local church, when you serve even behind the scenes, when you mop floors, when you change babies' diapers, when you mow the grass, you're advancing the mission to reach people for Jesus. Serving is pretty important. Jesus is creating a definition here. I want to make sure we grab the definition of service that Jesus shares. He talks about justice. He talks about mercy. And he talks about faithfulness. Let's talk about this heart of true service. Let's make sure we're lining up well. Here we go. Number one, justice. If you're looking for a definition, justice is righting a wrong that you didn't do. Justice is Lynn in my story approaching me. He didn't break that golf cart, but injustice had happened. And he approached and said, this is not right. How are we going to make this right? How can I empower you to do the right thing? Well, let me tell you this. I didn't even know this until years later as a leader myself. He had, he had been up. up with, college kids, we had slept in that morning, I'm sure. He had been up probably since 7 o'clock fixing this problem having the right conversations with the right people. It was wrong that we did this. Justice is righting a wrong that you didn't do. Justice is at the heart of God's kingdom. True service isn't just about following rules. It's about standing up for what is right, and the Pharisees missed this. They focused on the minor details while ignoring the weightier matters of justice. They failed to see the injustice around them, the pain of the marginalized, and the brokenness in society. We talked about bags that you could carry to the grocery store earlier. Did you realize that even in Hamilton County, there are folks, what was the word used? Food insecurity. We can be a part of the solution. We can be a part of going after fixing that problem. Justice is right in a wrong you didn't do. Number two, mercy is refusing justice that you deserve. You actually deserve justice. Mercy is when you receive that. Lynn looking at me and saying, oh my goodness, he didn't say this, but I felt it. I probably should be fired for this. I probably should lose a scholarship over this boneheaded, stupid decision. What was I thinking? He didn't have to shame me. I already felt shame. And in wisdom, he recognized that in the moment, and he extended mercy and grace that I didn't deserve. Mercy is the cornerstone of God's character. It's about extending grace to others just as God extends grace to us. The Pharisees were quick to judge and to condemn, but they were slow to show mercy. You can serve somebody by extending mercy to them. Number three, faithfulness is following Jesus. (laughs) But no one is looking. Picking up the trash when you're not doing that on display, but you're doing it because it's a job that needs to be done. Faithfulness is about consistency in our actions and in our attitudes. The Pharisees were externally faithful in their rituals, but their hearts were far from God at the the very same exact time. They were concerned with appearances, more concerned with that than with a genuine relationship with the creator God of the universe who was there to be in relationship with them and to restore them into right relationship with their father, who they were trying to work so hard to earn their way into his good graces. 
faithfulness is following Jesus when no one is looking around the church. I think this sometimes looks like serving in the nursery. Changing diapers. Why? Well, because it's a job that needs to be done. Maybe not, maybe not even because you like kids, but because Jesus loves children. And you're there to follow him and to serve like him. Sometimes here at our church, it looks like mowing the backyard. Not just the front yard, but the backyard. We mow our own grass here at Venture. I'm so grateful for the, the, the small army of volunteers that pull that off every week. Why? Because it needs to be done. And excellence in church programming, get this, it's attractive to the world outside these walls. In an excellence-driven culture, excellence, even in how we keep the lawn here at the church property, well, that speaks volumes, doesn't it? I'm so grateful for the small army that does that all the time. Here's what it can look like. I've seen this a few times. I was a youth pastor in a former ministry life. And I so appreciated the small army of folks that pulled that off, the youth coaches that served faithfully in my student ministries. But I'm thinking particularly right now of a couple of older senior saints like 70-year-olds who are much better at 6 a.m., perhaps, than midnight. But through a lens of love, they're up late in a dorm room, mentoring, serving a group of teens who want to be up late. And they're having honest conversations and imparting life wisdom to a group of teens. Listen, I, I would have this conversation all the time. People would look at me and say, I don't know if I'm cool enough to serve in student ministry. And I get it. Nothing can make you feel less cool than a 17-year-old girl who is cool and knows she's more cool than you are, and you feel that. You both recognize this. But through a lens of love, you roll up your sleeves and say, I'm here to serve, and I've got some wisdom and some life experience that I can't wait to share with you. They see that. Oh, my goodness, is that a cool opportunity to serve. Ah, So serving isn't just about getting stuff done. No. No. No, it's not. It's also about growing my heart. We're moving into the second reason why we serve. Stay tuned. Before we're done today, uh, I want to share with you there's a high call to action to serve. Let's be clear, though. This is not about checking items off of the to-do list. We have a staff axiom here at Venture. We talk about this often. We don't use people to get the work done. Rather, we use the work to get the people done. We genuinely believe that when you roll up your sleeves and you serve like Jesus called you to serve, it does something that actually grows your heart. Why do we believe that? The Bible talks about that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the leaders in the local church, and teachers to equip his people for works of service. This is why. This is why we do it. Why do we do this? Well, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, hold on to that word, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, the opposite of mature. Oh, so when we roll up our sleeves, when we serve, there is something there that grows us up in our faith. Instead of being tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. There is so much there. There's a whole sermon to unpack in that passage. Let me sum it up to say this. Serving should be important to us. It's not just for them, but serving, recovering Pharisees, is important to us. Why? Because when we serve, hmm, we grow. God grows us up as we serve. If you want to grow up in your faith, could I challenge you? Serve somebody. Can I preach just a little bit? Can we look back at that passage a little bit closer, Ephesians chapter 4? Christ gave himself to the apostles, to pastors, to equip his people for work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity. This is what we're aiming at, to become mature, the opposite of being an infant. There's a song in the 80s when Lynn, when he was mentoring me when I was a young man, Amy Grant sang this song, something about not being a baby, a fat little 
baby. Feed me, feed me, feed me. Stop following the Pharisees. What did they do? They picked up a book. Oh, this feels even like, really? We're going to talk about the Bible next week. What book did the Pharisees pick up? Well, they actually picked up a series of books, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and they could quote it backwards and forwards. And Jesus still had very harsh words for them. Maybe start following Jesus. What did he do? He picked up a servant's towel. Not picking up the Bible one more time, but picking up a servant's towel and putting your Bible knowledge to work. Last week I caught my heart. I don't know if you caught this moment or not, but in the middle of preaching about what we were talking about, grace, last week, I was trying to illustrate the Pharisees. They did this. They picked up the Bible over and over again. I was a part of a thing when I was in high school, middle school actually, and then early high school called Bible Bowl. At one point in time, I had a good chunk of the first five chapters of Genesis memorized. Why? So I could win in a competition. And to puff up my own ego, I don't know why I did it, but it was kind of the thing that we were doing. I look back on that era, and I'm not super proud of what was going on inside my heart, even through that process. Here's the Pharisee's confession. I already know way more than I'm willing to be obedient to. I already know way more than I'm being faithful to God with my life with. I'm not being obedient with all the things that I know I should be doing, and yet I'm constantly seeking to fill my head with more knowledge. Some of you, maybe you've seen this illustration. Have you heard the phrase, some of you have never, and it shows it's been popular on Twitter or whatever we're calling that now. Some of you have never had to forge your parents' signature, and it really shows. Let's hit another one. Some of you have never cried while doing a math problem, and it shows. How about this one? Some of you have never been the ugly friend in your friend group, and honestly, it shows. Let's skip to the last one. The last one I was going to share. Some of you have never shared a hotel room with your entire family, and it shows. My kids know that one forwards and backwards. We have five kids. Can we say it this way? Some of you have never selflessly served, and it shows. The recovering Pharisees, some of them, they had never selflessly served, and it showed. Have you ever done a double take and then a triple take, seeing something, and your brain brain is simultaneously telling you, you can't really be seeing what you think you're seeing? Let me show you this. I came downstairs to get my coffee the other day, and I'm getting ready to throw the coffee grounds in there as I'm making the cup, and I'm like, what in the world is going, did Elmo get caught in the garbage disposal? Let's go in a little closer so you can see what I'm talking about. (laughs) My next thought was, we have all the kids home right now. We've got two cats living in our house. I thought, did we have a horrible cat accident overnight? What am I seeing here? Well, it was a piece of onion or several pieces of onion that looked like googly eyes stuck down there (laughs) in the garbage disposal. Have you ever looked at one thing and you think it's this, but really it's something else? Might I suggest to you, if you see the church as a vehicle to feed me, it's actually something else. You're the church that God uses as a vehicle to feed others. That's the heart of service. We're not fat little babies. Feed me, feed me, feed me. Rather, we're called to serve What did Jesus say? And to give his life as a ransom for many. It's time to move from we to I. Each week during this series, I've talked about the 12 steps for the recovering Pharisee. And maybe you noticed the language the first three weeks were more, we do this and we do this. Could I suggest to you that today would be a brilliant time to turn that language to I language? For example, the first one. I admit that my single most unmitigated pleasure is to judge other people. 
If you look through all 12 of those, by the way, they are in your sermon notes in the app. You could see that I language repeated there. And you notice that underneath those declarations is a call to action to serve somebody beyond myself. We can learn from the Pharisees' mistakes. Let me show you how. This is how you learn, O oh, recovering Pharisees, to move past what they modeled. This is how you do it. You prioritize. First of all, we've already read this. You prioritize heart over hypocrisy. You prioritize, a skip to that in the notes, you prioritize heart over hypocrisy. Why? Because when you serve, you love like Jesus. How about this? Prioritize justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Why? Because when you serve, you live like Jesus. Prioritize servant leadership. Picking up trash is not beneath you. Why? Because when you serve, you lead like Jesus. Jesus very clearly spoke to this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. How do you serve? I want to send you out of here today with two very practical action steps. You heard Kaitha mention one just a minute ago. This is a new day here at Venture. This is a strategy we want to employ to make it easy. Eh, that's the wrong word. Uh, maybe systematically available to you to serve folks who don't have food. So when you go grocery shopping, you simply take this bag with you. There's some instructions. This is exactly what we're looking for this month. And while you're there, you buy some stuff for them selflessly. And then even anonymously, you can come in here to the building and you can just dump those things over here in the bin that are provided in the lobby. This is an opportunity for you to serve others. And I would encourage you, this is a way to see your own heart grow in that strategy. By the way, let me give you another very specific action step for this. Would you grab your smartphone right now and pull it out? Grab your phone, pull it out, go to venturechristian.church slash serve. That's found in your notes as well. If you're in the app, you could probably just click it there and it will take you there. VentureChristian.church slash serve. We believe that serving grows our hearts. It's discipleship 101. It gets us closer to Jesus. When you click that link on the page there at VentureChristian.church slash serve. It's going to pop up a serving interest form. Could I encourage you to fill this out? Make this an action step. If you're a recovering Pharisee like me, take this as an opportunity. Roll up your sleeves. Grab the servant's towel. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. This is the opportunity for us to put that into practice. Give us some basic information about yourself. Go back one uh, slide if you would. Here's an opportunity to serve in adult discipleship. Here's an opportunity to serve in a whole bunch of them in kids' ministry. Let's go ahead and hit the next page. You could serve the church office through clerical roles. Here's some opportunities there. We need a photographer or a whole small army of photographers. Facilities, there's opportunities there. Our online ministry, we've got ways to serve there. Outreach, first impressions, how to serve through that lens. Let's hit the next page. Student ministry, there's a whole bunch of opportunities to serve there. Worship ministry, a whole bunch there. Other opportunities. And then notice down here. There's two boxes that you can check. If you look through that and you're like, I'm not sure. Well, click the first one. Please contact me to help me determine the best way to serve. All of that is serving 101, and I would invite everyone to take that action step. Could I give you a 201 opportunity to serve? Jesus calls us first to simply roll up our sleeves and do the stuff that needs to be done. But then he also calls us into purpose. Have you ever taken a spiritual gifts inventory test? If you've never done that, I would invite you to do that. If you check, check that, let's go back. If you check that second box on that form, I'd like to receive a spiritual gifts test. One of our staff will reach out to you, walk you through that process. We could even identify this is how God has wired you to serve. These are your spiritual gifts. Let's align that with a way to serve maybe inside the walls of our church or outside the walls of the church that are exactly what he made you to do. 
please take advantage of that opportunity. 101, 201, there's a call to action. Would you stand up with me?